I invite you to turn to the book of 2 Chronicles. The book of 2 Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles chapter number 36, the very last chapter of the book of Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles is the view of Judah, primarily, the southern kingdom of Israel, from God's perspective. And it gives a less favorable light on this southern tribe. So 2 Chronicles chapter number 36. None of us can even begin to comprehend what Almighty God, the creator of all this world, the sustainer of life, the giver of life, the Redeemer, the Great Physician, the Light of the World, the Risen Savior of mankind. None of us could ever even begin to comprehend what that entity, Almighty God, wants to do in us, wants to do with us, wants to do through us. But if we want to see Almighty God work, then it is required that you and I begin working, that you and I get engaged, that you and I are aware, that you and I are mobilized for the things of God. We want to see God work, and yet we're sitting there in the lazy boy. We have armor. We've been discussing from Ephesians 6 the last three weeks about the armor of God. Some call it the panoply of God. That God has given from head to toe a covering that we are armed with. And we're armed for warfare. And that's suggestive in and of itself. But where is, the question is this, where do we use this armor? Where is it that we should apply the apparatus and the equipment that God has so richly and uh, so... Uh, blessingly given us especially in God's work is where it is it's God's work God arms us for his service God gives us this armor so that we could carry out his purposes and plans work especially God's work I've got to say this work for the Lord is not only the most fun, not only the most exciting, the most beneficial, the most rewarding kind of work that there is. It's also the only kind of work that has eternal significance. It will endure. And I can't think of a better portion of the Bible to draw from and to turn our attention to on the subject of service to God and work for God than the two books of Ezra and Nehemiah. I have you in 2 Chronicles, but we'll be looking at Ezra and Nehemiah in relation to this last portion of 2 Chronicles here that I'll point your attention to in just a moment. But let me just say this. You and I, our lives, here's how it's put by the Lord Jesus. Our, a man's life or our lives consisteth not in the abundance of the things which we possess. Our lives belong to God. And all God's people said amen. Our lives, our souls are His. And we're bought with a price. Our lives, according to Ephesians, are hid with Christ in God. Therefore, because that is the case, because we are His, because we belong to Him, because He bought us with a price, there is now a therefore. And the therefore, the response to that is, we got work to do. Jesus put it best when He said, know ye not that I must be about my Father's business? I echo the sentiment this morning. Jesus said in John 6, 34 and 38, He said, My meat, 
what, what sustains me? Meat is the Bible code language for food. My meat, Jesus said, is to do the will of him that sent me. How many of us can say that? How many of us could say, my meat, what I live for, what sustains me, what gives me life, what gives me purpose, is to do the will of him that sent me? Well, every born-again Christian ought to be able to echo that, for sure. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, Jesus said in John 6, 38. And so, for the next few weeks, you've come at a perfect juncture, because for the next few weeks... I want to study Ezra and Nehemiah with you in a, in a, in a mini-series that I've labeled Laboring for the Lord. Now there you have, there's JPs right there, rigging. You see them? You see them behind there? I don't have my glasses on. Let me see. Oh yeah, you can see them just there. Here's Jay. Look at those guns. Man, I'll tell you what. Jay's into rigging last I've checked is that what it's called rigging rigging yeah and that's some um, that is some um, that is that is manly stuff right there i love that jay if, if if your boss will let me or if you'll let me i'd like to come and see what you guys do someday because it's impressive but we have le several laborers here we have painters we have concrete guys we have riggers if that's what you call it rigging riggers we have cleaners we have preachers i don't know about some preachers but I know this one works. I know this one labors. You ask my wife, I'll tell you. She'll tell you too. Some of these preachers, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get out the paddle. I'm telling you that right now. I'm going to pull out that paddle. Bend over, boy. I got a few swats for you. They sit there sipping their coffee out of their Yeti mugs, smug as a bug in a rug, sitting there with their feet kicked up on the desk making mincemeat out of all the poor deacons, running them around till their hair catches on fire. Not me, not me. Oh no, that's not me. You ran into me in Walmart this week, you wouldn't even recognize me. Say, oh, preacher, I didn't know you, I didn't know you, you, you wore dirty clothes. I thought you slept at the church with your suit on. <laughs> now, I'm not like any other preacher. I do it all, I do it all. Some people would knock you. For that some people would say man you need to you need to get into that bible more oh believe me i'm in that bible i'm in i'm soaking every word up and you know what else i'm doing when i'm working i'm reciting it to myself try that one on for size i quote it to myself because it is the bread of life and it is by god's word that every man shall live not by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god i get it tuned in right into the i pipe it in right through the ear uh the earbuds and i embrace god's word at every turn and you can do that on the job it's a wonderful thing laboring for the lord laboring all right so now you're in second chronicles and if you were to turn the page, you would be in Ezra. And that's where we're going to spend the next few weeks in Ezra and then the cousin book that's after it, Nehemiah. But what, where you are right now, you're sitting there in the pews and you're thinking to yourself, what is Ezra? I never heard about Ezra. What's going on with that? I didn't know that was in the Bible. So I got to fill you in. I got to fill you in my notes. My notes here say <clears throat> context. Give the context. Context is what is surrounding the book. What are the events? Who's it written to? Who's it written by? What, what is the genre of writing? Is it poetry? Is it prose? Is it, is it, uh, is it didactic teaching? What, what is it being said? So the context is king, it's paramount. So we need to get the context of Ezra. But better, we better pray first. Why don't we do that? Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get right into the context. Heavenly Father, we're launching out on this little mini series. Before too long, we'll be in a bigger and broader series somewhere else in scripture, yet to be determined. 
But for the next few weeks, Lord, we're on this outset. Lord, and I pray, I do, I pray with all my heart that this mini-series would, be, would, would do much to get us motivated and engaged in the things that are of primary importance. Lord, I look over the crowd here as I pray, and, I, and I'm seeing faces that I've prayed for through the week. <laughs> Lord, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's a miracle that they're here in some cases. But they made it. And, and that's an answer to my prayer. And I pray there are many others, Lord, that, that need to hear these words. And I pray that they would uh, later via the live stream, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But that they would embrace these words too. So bless these series of messages in these books, we pray. In Jesus' glorious name, amen. And just as a side note, before we jump into the context of, uh, of, of Ezra, I do want everybody to know here, sincerely, I have been praying fervently for you, uh, and I'm lifting you up before the throne of grace, and I hope that you fear, feel those prayers. I hope that you know, every last one of you, I've been praying for you. I've been lifting you up. I, I, with my eyes, when you, no one's here and the lights are off, my eyes scan these pews. It helps me to pray for you, and I see where you, where you sit, and I lift you up, and I'm praying for you. Some of you have big needs and little needs, too. The, the little needs are, are still important, and we're praying for all of them. We're praying for you. I, personally, am praying for you. Seriously, I want you to know that. Okay, with that said, the book of Ezra is placed in our Bible in such a place that makes it seem like it's older than it is because, you know, because in our Western minds, we automatically assume that the Bible is laid out chronologically, and it's not. The Bible is not laid out chronologically, especially in the Old Testament. If we were actually to lay out the Old Testament chronologically, where we are in 2 Chronicles 36, and then the next few books Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther would be at the very last part of the Old Testament if it was laid out chronologically, right? So the events in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah are really the very last events that are recorded in the Old Testament era. So, so after what happens here, and by the way, what happens here from 2 Chronicles 36, 22, all the way to the end of Nehemiah is, is about a span of about 20, let's say 22 years. I want you to keep that in mind throughout this series. This is about a 22-year time frame that we're looking at. Now, you and I haven't been together that long. At max, we've been, we've been together seven years, you and I, as, as, a, as a church family, because that's how long I've been here. I was just looking at it today. Uh, yesterday, rather, seven years, almost uh, seven years to the month, about, a little over now, seven years and one month to be precise. So we haven't been there together. So I want you to realize that what happens here is 22 years in the making. And it happens at the very last portions of the Old Testament era. After these events, there is what's called a 400 years of silence that we call the intertestamental period. You could in your Bible between the Old and New Testaments in big black marker write 400 years of silence, intertestamental period. So it was a span of about 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament that would lapse before the events of the New Testament begin with Zechariah in the temple that day who the angel says, you're going to have a baby. You're going to call him John the Baptist. And John will be the forerunner of Christ Jesus, the cousin of Jesus Christ. Now, long before that, long before that, I'm taking you all the way back to 586 B.C. Now, if you look at the way we tell time today, you're going to see B.C.E. or you're going to see C.E. We used to do B.C. and A.D., B.C., before Christ. A.D., Amino Domino, the year of our Lord. We don't do that anymore in the secular realm. But just so you know, until the day I die, brother, I'm going to be saying B.C. and A.D., just so y'all know. So I'll be doing that. So don't get confused. When I say B.C., I mean before Christ. When I say A.D., I mean since he was born and since he came. And so... 
In 586 BC, ready for some history? Who's ready? I'm ready. I was getting real excited. And then I saw your faces grumpy like, I don't want to know I'm 586 BC. Just tell me God loves me and let me get out the door. But in 586 BC, Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem for the third time. And this time he carries away all those brilliant, shiny little lads, the Jews that were living there, such as Daniel. You ever read about Daniel in the Old Testament? Oh, yes, you did. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. These were the Jews that came from Jerusalem under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar said, man, I, I got to put these guys to use. Bring them to my kingdom. And so he did. He carries them the way, and this introduces the, what we call the Babylonian exile or the Babylonian captivity. This is really uh, the, 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 the continuation of the diaspora. When all of the Jews would be displaced, they would be dislodged and displaced by force from their homeland because God was judging them. This homeland called Israel was given to Abraham long ago to Abraham's seed and to Abraham's people. But since they rebelled against God time and time again, he said, I'm, I'm done with you. I'm going to judge you. I'm sending the Assyrians to Israel in the 700s uh, BC. And now I'm dealing with Judah. Judah's judgment was delayed a bit because Judah definitely was more godly. The more godly we are, the more favor we'll have with God. 586 should have never happened, but it did. And Nebuchadnezzar comes along and he takes many of the Jews out of Jerusalem, Daniel and his three friends included, and he brings them to Babylon to serve in his court. Hmm. Now, this very thing was prophesied beforehand by Jeremiah. Jeremiah the prophet said that this exact thing would happen. He told them that this would happen, and he not only told them that this exile would occur, that, that Nebuchadnezzar would pull the people out and bring them to Babylon, but guess what? He also said that it's going to only be for 70 years. And we see that in Jeremiah 29, verse number 10. You also want to look Jeremiah 27, 22. But primarily, if you're taking notes, Jeremiah 29, 10, it is amazing. I love seeing fulfilled prophecy in the Word of God because it makes me just want to love my Jesus more. It makes me just want to hold on to God even tighter. It makes me just want to read my Bible all the more when I see fulfilled prophecy. So Jeremiah says this, and then Daniel, so, so Jeremiah, and then Daniel, he is now in the captivity. He even cites, in, Jer in Daniel 9, 2, he even cites Jeremiah's prophecy. Isn't that cool? You probably never realized that these prophets knew one another and that they cited one another from time to time. And, uh, and then in the New Testament, there's thousands of citations from the Old Testament because it's all together and it all dovetails and it's all powerful and it's all important and we need every bit that we can get because God's words, every last jot and tittle will in no wise pass until all are fulfilled. This brings us then to 2 Chronicles. We fast forward from the time that Nebuchadnezzar takes the, the city captive. We fast forward 70 years now. The time of the Babylonian captivity or exile has been fulfilled according to Jeremiah's statements. And guess what? A little bit more history. Persia is now the world leader under Cyrus. Cyrus the Great. He wasn't a born-again Christian, folks. But just like many presidents of the United States of America in the past and present, God can use them to accomplish his purposes and his will. Cyrus was no lover of God, but God used Cyrus in a most unfathomable way, as we shall see in just mere moments. 
2 Chronicles gives us the statements that bring us into the very context and setting of Ezra and Nehemiah. There is work to be done back in Jerusalem. The word work appears seven times in the book of Ezra, and the word build appears 13 times, and Ezra only has 10 chapters. Now, the moment you've been waiting for, 2 Chronicles 36, verse 22, where it says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing. And this is what he said. Thus saith King Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Wow. Now that's in 2 Chronicles 36. This is the last part of the Old Testament era. This happened, Cyrus said these very words in 538 B.C. In 516, the temple is going to be dedicated. From 586 to 516 is exactly 70 years that would be fulfilled and determined upon the people. So, several years uh, before the completion of the temple, Cyrus makes this decree. We know that it was in 538 B.C. And Cyrus sends the children of Judah... By the way, when they were in Babylon, that's where the Judahites became the Jews or the Jewish nation. They weren't called Jews until they were in, the, in Babylon. They were called the Judahites. And now that's where we get the word Jew or Jewish from. These individuals are now ready to go back because they come with a decree from the powerhouse of the, of the entire world. The greatest king at the time, Cyrus. Persia, of Persia. He sends them back. He says, it's time to go back to your homeland. God has put it on my heart and I'm sending you back so that you can build God's house up. Now that's incredible to think about it. It's actually unbelievable. If, you, if it was outside of God, it would absolutely be unbelievable. I want to just show you on the outset here this morning on this topic of laboring for the Lord, I just want to show you two responses to common fallacies in regards to working for God. Here's our first response to a common fallacy that we see. A lot of times you and I are stiff and we're stale and we are unable, we're, we're, we're Osmosis, uh, that's not the right word. Edit that out. We, we get into this place of rigidity where we can't seem to function. We can't move. You know, one of the ways they say to keep young, to, to maintain a younger, healthy body is to always be moving, to moving. Once you stop moving, you know, and it's the same thing with mechanics. You got to oil things up. If they don't move, I used to work on a backhoe. We'd have to grease that thing up every day um, because it gets rust and, and, and before too long, you can't move it effectively. So we got to keep moving. We got to keep going. We got to work. We got to, there's things to do. And I want to show you two responses to the common fallacies in regard to working today. And, uh, and that is, here, here's the first one. And I find it really overarching the entire book. So I don't know that I'm going to cite one particular uh, part of, the, of Ezra as you turn the page from 2 Chronicles into the book of Ezra now. I don't know that I'm going to point to one particular verse under this point. But here's the first point this morning. 
As we think about laboring for God, a lot of times we come up with different excuses, as I was alluding to a moment ago. And here's a response. And I know it's simple. And I know it seems trite. And I know it just seems almost like grounds for mocking or for yawning. But God can do anything. God can do anything. I'm not saying that He will do everything. But I'm saying that He can do anything. When all seemed totally helpless, God raised up Cyrus. Now I wonder, I just have to wonder, of all of those that were in bondage in Babylon, you understand they did not have their own national identity. I mean, they did under the, the undercurrents of it. They did uh, quietly. But uh, they, they were subjected. They were under subjection. And I just have to wonder how many of them were walking the streets of Babylon that day when Babylon met its doom. When Babylon was over. And there's a new power player now on the scene. There's a, there's a new bully on the block. And his name is Cyrus of Persia. I just have to wonder how many of those Jews really ever saw it coming. I wonder how many of those Jews knew Jeremiah 29, 10, who knew that God would someday in, in exactly seven years bring this all to a completion. I wonder how many of them doubted a little bit. I wonder of them how many of them just sat there in the pews, kind of smug, kind of just a little bit relaxed, a little bit uh, recalcitrant, holding on to their grudges on this and that. One and I told them not to use that carpet. I told them I, told them I didn't want that, that screen up there. I told them those lights were too blue. I told them, I told them, I, I told them we shouldn't have done that. I said we shouldn't have done that. And here we are. And I wonder how many of those Jews sounded a lot like some Christians in the United States of America today in our churches. In Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 20, we read about God who can do what? Exceeding abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think of of Him. In Genesis chapter number 18, verse number 14, the question is asked, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Abraham asked it, but I have reason to believe that some of those Jews in Babylon, the day that Babylon was over, weren't asking the same questions of Moses. This is why Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Who among the Jews could have imagined that Cyrus of Persia would not only defeat the Babylonians, but that he would grant and permit that these subjug subjugated Jews could return, and not just return, I'm telling you, return with authority. Return with an attitude. Return with strength behind them. The, the, the wind in their sails, brother, I'm telling you, they got money to do this. They got money from Cyrus to build the temple again that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed because of their rebellious behavior some 50 years earlier. You and I, friend, need to remember in our labor for the Lord, whether it's corporately, you know, whether it's in regards to the church, which, by the way, we could use a lot more of corporate laborers. I'll sign you right up. I got a pen, and I'm ready to use it. Let me get your name and number right now. We'll sign you up. There's a thousand. Let me take that back. There's 10,000 things to do around here. And we can do it if God helps us. So where was I? Let me see. Oh, yes. Whether corporately, 
whether individually, as we raise our little children. It's amazing how many times Ezra mentions the children. I dare you to look up the word children and the, the phrase little ones in the book of Ezra. You'll be stunned to see how many times it's mentioned. God cares about these little ones as we raise them individually, as we love our spouses, and as we live a holy and separated life in Christian. That's what we need to be doing in these days and in these hours. He can use the smallest. He can use the largest things. He can do the smallest things. He can do the hugest things. He wants us to know this. He wants us to remember this. That He is God. And that he can do anything. Which is why he shows us things that we have no reason to legitimately doubt. He shows us. This is the same God that parted the Red Sea for Moses. What did Moses have? Nothing. God parts that Red Sea. And proverbially, proverbially, let me just tell you. There are Red Seas that sometimes you and I are going to come to. That will need him to part. And I'm saying proverbially, I'm saying taking and looking at the precedent, if God can do that for the children of Israel, there's nothing He cannot do in us. And all God's people said amen. See, I have to coach you through this now. Say amen. Amen, preacher. This is the same God who dropped Jericho's walls for Joshua. This is the same God who led Ruth to the exact field to meet Boaz. It just says that her hap was. I love that. Hap. Her happenstance. Her chance was. It just so happened that little Ruth the Moabitess goes to the exact field she needed to go to to find a kinsman redeemer in Boaz to raise up seed to Malon her husband who was dead that would preserve her life and that through her and through Boaz, there would be a son named Jesse who would have a son named David who had a son named Jesus. Woo! I tell you what! This is the same God who guided that smooth stone from David's sling to Goliath's forehead. This is the same God who heard Elijah's prayers and sent fire down on Mount Carmel. This is the same God who completely vanquished 185,000 Syrian troops because Hezekiah said, oh God, I need you. And God said, all right, you need me? I like hearing that prayer. Here you go. Psst, they're dead. A hundred and eight, are you kidding me? A hundred and eighty five thousand Syrian troops. This is the same God who delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. And he delivered Daniel from the lions in that den. This is the same God who raised his son from the dead. I can't help to get excited when I start thinking about a God who can do anything. It's time to put Him in action. It's time to mobilize Him through prayer and through trust. That's what I'm saying today. Now I want to read you something from the Word of God. It's in Isaiah 40. And this is what it says. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand. And his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work is before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom. And shall gently lead those that are with young. Hallelujah. Who hath measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand? Who hath meted out heaven? with a span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being His counselor, hath taught Him? With whom took He counsel, and who instructed Him and taught Him in the path of judgment, and taught Him knowledge, and showed to Him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance. 
Behold, he taketh up the islands as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. To whom then will ye liken God? Or to whom shall ye compare unto him? See, that's our God. That is our God. I love how, we, how Isaiah said, Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. You all know about Lebanon? Lebanon was where they got the cedars for the temple. Lebanon was a forest. Up in Lebanon there, there was the greatest trees that the world had ever known. And they would hew those trees down. They would fell those trees and they would build the greatest prized architecture that the world had ever known. All of those trees in that lush, deciduous forest were not enough to burn for a burnt offering. You could hew them all down. You could set up every altar from here to kingdom come, from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> and you could put all of the beasts that were finding refuge in that forest on those altars. And it wouldn't be enough to burn a sacrifice to this holy one, to this great one. Our God can do anything and we need to remember that as we labor for Him. I hasten on to my second point, and that is not only that God can do anything, but that God can use anyone. God can use anyone. I'm not saying that He will. I'm just saying that He can. Now, I, I, I concede, because I, I know there are smart Alex in the audience. <laughs> Was that mean? Sorry. You're not a smart aleck. You're just astute Bible scholars. I, I will concede that God does have a protocol that generally He lays out and He follows. True enough. For instance, in the Old Testament, He uses the priests who had to be of the tribe of Levi. And in the New Testament, there are indeed stipulations for the preacher, for the uh, pastor. Uh, but that said, God can use anyone. He uses anyone willing to be used for a vast array of purposes. We're going to turn to Exodus. And we'll, while you're turning to Exodus 3, let me point out that it was Moses who stuttered and as you're turning to Exodus, I, I, I will tell you that Gideon was the least significant of all. Gideon was the last one of the last family of the last tribe. And yet God said, you're going to be used, son. I want to use you to accomplish great things for my people. Gideon. It was Rahab who was a prostitute. Are you kidding me? It was Jael that had the nail. Jail with the nail, I call her. Jail with the nail. Catherine remembers that when I was up preaching at uh, the chapel service, and I brought in a big spike this long, and I did the sermon on jail with the nail. She defeated Sisera for Deborah and for Barak in the book of Judges. It was just this little peasant girl. She was just a young lady. There she was in the tent. All of a sudden, she sees Sisera running up the hill. She says, I know who that dude is. Give me, I'm going to get him now. Bring them in here. I'll lay down. I'll keep you safe. I'll keep you comfortable. Lay down. Here's some milk. Here's a little warm glass of milk. <laughs> Dead. Hey, Barak. Hey, Queen Deborah. You looking for Sisera? His head stapled to the ground in my tent. Come and take him away. Ruth was a Moabitess. Who was she? She, she was raised. She didn't know about Jesus. She wasn't in a Baptist church. She just was some girl who said, I want what you, I want your God. I, want, I know enough to know that your God is a sustainer. God can use anyone. He used Esther, who was just one of the king, King Artaxerxes' uh, many subjects. I mean, she was beautiful. But beyond that, David was a shepherd boy that, that uh, 
He was the runt of the litter. All these big boys with their big chest came out. There's Eliab, there's Shema, there's the rest of them. Yeah, I'm going to be the king. I'm going to be anointed. Nope. 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 Do you have any more sons, Jesse? Nope. Nope. All seven of them passed through. You have any more? Because God says, Is anyone? yeah, I have one more. I mean, he couldn't possibly be the one. He's out there tending to the sheep. Get him in here. Come in. Oh, this little guy. Give me the oil. He's king. The Bible says there is a lad here with two small fishes, five barley loaves. God will use anyone to accomplish great things. How would you like to be that little lad there in Matthew? that offered Jesus the lunch and he multiplied it for thousands of millions. God can do that type of thing. And I'm not saying he will do it, but if he can do it, then what, then what limits does he have? What limits does he have for us? There are no limits. You're the limit. What? You're the limit. Okay, fine. I'm the limit too. We're all the limit. We're the ones. He's not limited. It's you and me that are limiting Him. If God is able to use all these, then surely He wants to use us. He wants you to do things for Him because He's not here right now. He's in you. He wants to put you to work so that you would do great things, so that you would make many mighty exploits for the kingdom's sake. We're not building our own kingdom the last time I checked, you and I are building his kingdom here. That's the job. That's what he wants us to do. And if he used all these, you're in Moses here in Exodus 3. We're going to get to him in just a second. But the Bible uses the small things, watch this now, to confound the weak things. He uses the small things. He uses the, uh, the, the weak things to confound uh, the big things and the powerful things in the book of 1 Corinthians. He even spoke through a donkey once, JR. Remember that? He spoke through a donkey because no one else was willing to. So he said, I'm going to have to use this donkey. Draw nigh to God. You say, how, pastor? How can I do it? I don't know what to do. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. I didn't say it. James did. Cleanse ye your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Now, in Isaiah 6, God asks the question. He says, who shall go for us? Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. You're in, a, you're in Exodus. Exodus 3. Exodus 3. I want to give you some excerpts and some blips from a previous sermon long ago. Because it's important. Now, he can use anyone. I need to tell you, excuse making is normal in this thing. Excuse making is normal. I'm going to step on your toes a little bit, all right? So put on the, put on the uh, steel-toed boots today. I'm going, to put, I'm going to step on them a little bit. You won't mind. I know you'll be the better for it, okay? You listen up. You're here for a reason. God brought you here. Excuse making is normal. I do it every day, and I'm so sorry. You need to do the dishes. I can't do the dishes right now, sweetie. I got, I got, I got something, and you see something in my nail here, and I, I, I can't get my, it's, if it gets wet, I can't, I can't operate this way. Well, what about your other hand? Oh, I'll come up with something. Excuse making is normal, but that doesn't make it acceptable. Can we all agree? It's normal, but it's not acceptable. And there are many excuses. God, I'm too young. God, 
I'm just looking around here. God, I'm too old. <laughs> I had to change that one up a little bit. God, I don't know the correct way to do that for you. I don't know. Oh, what can I? I can't. I can't. <laughs> no. God, I'm too tired. God, I'm too busy. God, I'm too poor. God, I'm too sinful. God, I don't want to lose this friendship. By the way, if they keep you from serving the Lord, they ain't your friend. I'm just glad Jesus didn't offer any excuses, amen, when he died in my place. I'm a pretty good excuse. In other words, I'm a very good excuse for Jesus not to die. I'm like, I don't think so, Lord. Not, not this one. I'm sorry. I'm a very good excuse. But Jesus didn't cite me as one of those excuses to not die on the cross. Praise him. Praise him that he didn't make an excuse. So you know what the craziest, remarkable thing about excuses is? Is when it comes to serving God, there aren't any excuses. Excuses pass responsibility. God has trusted and trusted to us the task of prom, uh, promoting and uh, getting out the word. We are fishers of men, Matthew 4, 19. Excuses pass responsibility off to somebody else. Stop with the excuses. Excuses propose restraints. They suggest that limitations exist with God, and God is not restrained. God would have never asked you and, to, and me to serve Him if it was impossible for us to do so. We just like making excuses, and we've become pretty crafty at making them. But God sees through them. And you know what's crazy? Everyone around you sees them too. It's kind of unbelievable. Don't make excuses. I told you I was going to step on your toes a little bit. We're in Exodus 3. God wants Moses to do something great. Moses had killed an Egyptian, and he fled to a far, vast away land, he fled. He wanted to get away from the things of God. He rose up for a power. He was a flash in the pan. He was a shooting star. He came up for a moment. He's like, I'm going I'm to take this into my hands. I'm going to do something for God. He saw he was on. He, things were on edge. Things were kind of icy. Things were kind of not good with him and Pharaoh and Pharaoh's people in the kingdom. And he said, I'm getting, I'm going to do things now, Lord. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make things happen, Lord. And he goes out and he sees that Egyptian beating that one man. He couldn't take it. He rose up with anger. He killed that Egyptian. He buries him in the sand. The next day comes, and they said, what are you going to do? He tries to get these people to not fight. And they say, what are you going to do? Kill us like that Egyptian? His heart started to, to beat. He said, man, if these, if these people know that I killed that, then how many other people know? And it's only going to be a matter of time before Pharaoh knows, and I'm a goner. I better get my butt out of here. And Moses goes, and for 40 years, he's in a wilderness place. And 40 years later, there is God who meets him at the burning bush. He says, I got a plan for you to finish what you started way back when. When you took matters into your own hands. Now I'm on the throne. I whittled you down to nothing, shepherd boy out here, shepherd man, old shepherd man, shepherd decrepit man with a long beard, Ben-Hur guy, Charleston Heston. I got you right where I want you. Now you can't, you can't do anything, boy. Now I'm going to get all the glory. And would you believe that Moses starts making excuses to the very face of God why he couldn't do what God was asking him to do. God made it very clear in chapter number 3. I want you to see in verse number 11, Exodus 3, 11, excuse number 1. He says in verse number, it's, it's a, uh, uh, okay, Exodus 3, 10, Come now, therefore, and I will send, this is God speaking, I'll send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now that's the simple plan. That's, that's easy. Just go and I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to bring my people out of Israel, or uh, my, my children of Israel out of Egypt, rather. Here's excuse number one. Who am I? That's excuse number one. See, Moses is going to get real crafty here. Who am I? He says in verse number 11, Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto, the, unto Pharaoh 
and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now let me just ex explain real quick what's going on. In this first response, in this first excuse, we see, yes, we see the humility of Moses. But you know what? False humility is a thing. We can hide behind false humility. Oh, I, I'm not. I, I, who am I? I can't do that. I mean, I, I couldn't really possibly do that. True humility is not a result of an undervaluation of one's abilities. Rather, it's truly humbling when an individual is keenly aware that anything he has is from Almighty God. Amen. We see not only the humility of uh, the, uh, the, the humility, the false humility of Moses in this first response, but then we, but we also see the uncertainty of Moses. Humility is an honorable thing. It's an honorable virtue. Listen to me now. But there is nothing to respect in a lack of confidence. Oh, who am I? I mean, I can. Yeah, you know what? I can't preach a, uh, a funeral. I can't. I can't officiate a wedding. I can't lead a church. I can't come up with a sermon either. But I know one who can do all those things through me. And he can enable you just like he enables me every day on this job. Every single day on this job. For all seven years that I have been serving you in this church, I can tell you there's not a single day that I've done it in my own strength. Who am I? The, the second excuse because I know you've offered these too. Listen to me now. Listen, I want your attention. Who, who are you, Lord? Who, who am I? But secondarily, in verse 13, Exodus 3, who are you? Listen carefully to what Moses is indeed excusing. It seems like it's a legitimate question. Who are you? But it's actually an excuse. And the excuse is, see, God, I don't know enough. See, God, I'm telling you now, Lord, I don't know enough about you to be in that Sunday school with those kids. Man, those kids know more than me. Those little second grader kids, I mean, I know Pastor Getz's kid. He knows that whole Bible. I don't know enough, Lord. I don't think I can serve in the nursery because those two-year-olds, they got the Bible down pat. And what if they ask me a question that I can't answer? Lord, I just can't do that. Lord, there's no way. There's no way I can go out on Saturday visitation when the virus isn't around. Because I know that, Lord, someone on that porch is going to ask me something too hard. Lord, I don't know you enough. Lord, who am I? Lord, who are you? I don't even know you enough. Lord, you want me to take the children of Israel out of Egypt? I can't do that. How can I do that? I don't know you. I don't know. I've been over here doing this shepherding thing. I don't know you. When they ask me your name, I'm not going to have an answer, Lord. A lot of us hide behind that one. A lot of us, uh, I just don't. I'm not where I need to be yet, preacher. Well, then get where you need to be. I'll help you. Give me your hand. I'll pull you. I'll drag you. Four one in the Exodus four one, he makes a third excuse. He says, "God, who's going to believe me?" Oh, Lord, come on. Who's going to believe? Who am I? Lord, who are you? Lord, who's going to believe me in the third place? So what Moses says to God is, they'll not believe me. They're not. Do you hear the excuse? It, the, the excuse is, Lord, they're not going to believe me. They're not going to believe me. Did Moses suddenly become omniscient? Is he saw all of a sudden God now, I guess. How could Moses possibly see the future? I guess he just sees the future now. And yet, you and I make that mistake. Oh, man, across the street, man, he, they ain't going to listen to me. They're not going to believe They're not going to believe me. See, what this is called, actually, this is called pessimism. That's what that's called. That third excuse right there is pessimism, cynicism. Oh, boy, I'm telling you, I know this is getting long in here. I know, but I need to tell you. I'll make it up to you tomorrow, next Sunday with a shorter sermon, but I need to tell you we're full, we're full of this pessimism right now. In this church right now and in every other church, we are a bunch of pessimist Christians, I tell you what. We are a bunch of cynics. You know, two pessimists, they, they met at a party. And instead of shaking hands, they just shook their heads. 
They just look and went up. Nope. You know, as a man thinketh in his heart, the Bible says, so is he. Oh, God, who am I? Oh, who are you? Lord, who's going to believe me? Fourth excuse in chapter number 4, verse number 10. Who could possibly listen to me, Lord? Lord, even if I wanted to go, I'm not physically able to, to perform. Now, Moses labored under a natural defect uh, that prevented him from freely, fluently expressing his ideas. He says that he's slow of speech and that he's slow of tongue. And uh, that, may be, that may be the case. But I know of a God who it says of him that he created the hearing ear and that he created the seeing eye. The Lord made even both of them. And if he made my big old ears and if he made my big old nose and if he made my big old uh, eyes, then he surely made this big old mouth too. And he surely can do whatever he wants to do with it. Even if he stutters, God can still use it. God has an epic response in verses 11 and 12 to this particular excuse. He says, who made man's mouth? That's right. So don't tell me what I can do and what you can't do. Don't be telling me, Moses. Why are we coming up with excuses? I can't go to church because, because the virus. Well, then why'd you go to Walmart yesterday? Get consistent. I can't go because I've got an ingrown toenail right now. Yeah, well, then why are you doing everything else you're doing? You can still walk on that thing. I'll carry you up the steps if it's that bad. Meet me in the parking lot. I'll go out there and I'll pick you up out of your car and I'll carry you up. I'm getting long. Let me go on. Who am I? Who are you? Who will believe me? Who could possibly listen to me? And if you can believe it, right there at that burning bush, Moses comes up with a fifth excuse why he can't work. I believe in my heart of hearts, I believe that God can use anyone. Moses didn't believe that. He needed a little convincing. He says in the fifth place in 4.13, he says, who else could you send instead of me? Who else could you send instead of me, Lord? Do you hear the excuse behind it? You can send someone else, can't you? We make that excuse. You and I make that excuse. God, I know I can't do it, but I know that because as Pastor Getz always says, you are so big and strong, Lord. I know that even though I cannot be the one to tell that poor sinner about you, I know that you can send someone else. And so, oh, Lord, I'm praying that you would send somebody. You ever prayed that prayer? Oh, Lord, I'm praying that you would send somebody to my boy, that you would send somebody to my neighbor. Oh, Lord, I'm praying. And meanwhile, the someone is you. You don't have to be mean and cruel and nasty. You don't have to be dogmatic. Just say, Lord, how can I be used today? You can send someone else. You know what's crazy about that excuse that we make too is it's true. The sad thing about that fifth excuse that Moses makes, it is true. God has unlimited resources at his disposal. But here is, here, here is, the, here is the, 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 uh, the crescendo. It is true that he, that he can use anything to convert that little boy of yours or to do the unspeakable things that need to be done in your life. But he wants to use you. And he wants to get glory using you in all of your frailties, in all of your weaknesses, in all of your setbacks, in all of your youth, in all of your inexperience, in all of your oldness and fragileness in all of your ways he still gets glory using you because that's just the way he is there's so much more i want to say on the topic of work and laboring for the lord but i trust that these two overarching points that god can do anything and that god can use anyone 
will get us into first gear and get us going for the rest of the mini-series over the next few weeks. Let's pray. So, Lord...